Okay, so we have the utility function now in terms of units per human, per unit of human capital terms. So let's now plug, here's our utility function, our flow utility function. Let's plug in our new definition into the lifetime household utility. Okay, so here's our lifetime household utility. And all we're gonna do is just this part here is what we derived um, for this part here, okay? So that's one change we made here on the second line. The other change is a small change. Uh, we have assumed that the labor force grows with rate, growth rate n, so we can write lt as the initial labor force times e to the power nt. Okay, so then we've got this goes to here. Okay, so we've just made those two substitutions, that's it. Um, now, you'll notice that we have these terms here, which don't change over time. So we can just pull them out front, take them outside of the integral. That makes our lives easier, makes our integral smaller. Right, so what's left over? Well, we've got this thing here. We're gonna call this B. It's some constant, right? And then we've got these three exponential terms. We're just going to add up their powers and then make the substitution here so that we can just have e to the negative beta t instead of these three exponential terms. All right, then we have this nice lifetime utility function that now looks quite, doesn't look as complicated as it looked before. Okay, all in terms of units, consumption per unit of human capital, basically. Okay, now you'll notice that we now have this beta. What we don't want to have happen is we don't want this beta to be negative. If that happens, then you can see that the more we delay our consumption, the bigger a boost it's gonna give us at time zero. So what someone at time zero would want to do would be to just save everything and then consume everything at the very end of their lifetime or you know, off when they approach infinity um, because this would be e to some positive power times t. So we really wanna make sure that this beta is positive so that this power here is negative. Okay, so what does that mean in practice? It means in practice that we want the discount rate to be high enough. We need people to be impatient enough. And how impatient? Well, they have to be so impatient that they don't care that one, there's gonna be more family members, right? More utility off the longer we wait because the family is growing exogenously at rate n. Okay, so they have to be impatient enough that they can sort of counteract that factor. And then this is an interesting one. You can see that we have this one minus theta here. Okay, so um, whether this term is positive or negative depends on the direction that this goes. And here's the intuition behind it. Let's consider theta that's small, which means that we have a lot of intertemporal substitution. Okay, we very easily shift our consumption between periods. If that's true, then you know the fact that we're very productive in the future means that we want to delay our consumption to the future when we're very, very productive. Okay, if that's the case, then we're sort of, um, then it means that, again, this is gonna count kind of against our, our impatience, against, against our discount rate. So our discount rate has to be high enough to counter, uh, counteract that uh, force. On the other hand, suppose that theta is very large, which means that people uh, want to spread their consumption out. Uh, consumption in one period is not like consumption in another period. We want to have kind of the same in every period. If that's the case, then this force is gonna help us in a sense because um, we're not gonna wanna put our consumption all off way in the future. We're gonna want it to be, uh, we're gonna want our consumption to be, uh, to be similar in every period. Okay, so that's gonna make this beta more positive, okay? So that's the intuition anyway. So we need this beta to be positive so that the term here, the power on the exponent, the exponential power here is negative, okay? Okay, so where are we? What have we done so far? Uh, obviously we've done a lot of calculations, but really almost all of them were doing one thing, which is putting things in terms of uh, 
per of per human per unit of human capital terms. And why do we do that? Well, because as I insinuated earlier, we want to put everything in, in terms of little k here, which as you'll recall is big K divided by AL, because we're gonna find a steady state of the economy where little k here doesn't change. Okay, that's gonna be our balanced growth path. So that's gonna stay constant forever. Capital will grow, human capital will grow even in our steady state, but little k will stay constant. Okay. So we've described the economy. Now what we have left to know is how uh, firms and households optimize given the prices in the economy. Then finally after that, we're going to put uh, firm and household decisions together in order to find an equilibrium price level. We need, we need to find a price level so that firms decisions are consistent with household decisions. And then we're going to use that to solve for a path of the economy. So first let's do the easy one, which is the firm. So firms, they just, they don't have a intertemporal problem. They're just trying to maximize their profits period by period. Okay. So the firm is going to notice here, there's an implicit price. We're assuming the implicit price of output is one. So the implicit price of output is one. So here's the revenue that the firm gets. It's its production. What are its costs? It has labor costs. So the amount of labor it hires times the wage. And then the amount of capital that the firm employs times the rental cost of capital. Those are the two costs. All right, let's take the first order conditions, standard profit maximization problem. So let's take the derivative of revenues with respect to labor and uh, well derivative of profits with respect to labor so we're going to get the way that revenues depend upon labor and then we're going to get the wage is equal to zero here's the marginal cost here's the marginal revenue do the same with uh, capital here's the marginal revenue to an increase in capital there's the marginal cost of using one more unit of capital and we get this very nice uh, relationship since do we, we haven't actually chosen a production function yet. We will do that, but for now we're not choosing one. Okay, now as we've been doing, we're gonna put everything in terms of per unit of human capital. Okay, so we've got this relationship from the last slide, marginal revenue has to equal marginal cost. Now, um, note that big F of KAL is equal to AL times little f of KAL. How do I get that? Well, you know, big F, let's, I'll just do this one, big F of KAL, let's multiply it by AL divided by AL. Well, that's gonna equal AL times big F of K divided by AL, one, which is our definition of little f. Okay, so it's gonna be AL times little f of K divided by AL. Okay. So that's how I got to this from here to here. All right, now uh, let's take this derivative, okay. So if we take the derivative, you can see that we're gonna have a product rule involved. We're taking the derivative with respect to K. So that's, is this called product rule? This is called something else. But anyway, the point is it's gonna be F prime of K divided by AL times the derivative of K divided by AL with respect to K, which is just one divided by AL. Okay, so we end up with this expression, AL times F prime of K AL times the derivative of k divided by al with respect to k, uh, with respect to k, one divided by al, okay? Notice we can cross these guys out. So we end up with f prime of little k. Okay, so that was 
a somewhat complicated calculation, but the result of it is that the interest rate or the rate of return is simply equal to f prime of little k. Okay, so that's kind of the easy one. The harder one, because we're taking the derivative with respect to something in the denominator, is, uh, is the wage. But we're going to do a similar, similar calculation. So uh, this substitution from this step to that step is exactly the same. Now let's take this derivative. Now we do have to use the product rule. So we have to take the derivative of this part first and then add to it the derivative of this part. Okay. So you can see that the derivative of al with respect to l is just a. So we get a times f of little k. And then uh, the way I like to think about this one, I like to always, the way to make things a little bit easier here, we're going to get al times f prime of k divided by al times the derivative now of k divided by al with respect to l, okay? So this is somewhat complicated, right? So how do you think about it? I like to rewrite it like this. So what's the derivative of k divided by al with respect to l? Well, that's equal to the, we're just gonna rewrite this a little bit. It's gonna be k a to the power negative one, l to the power negative one with respect to l. And then it's obvious that this is gonna be um, k divided by a times l to the power negative two, okay? So that's what I have here, k divided by a times l to the power, l, well, you know, l to the power negative two, right? One divided by l squared. So that's how I got here. Now you'll notice there's an a on both of these terms. Let's take that outside, factor that out. We get this expression. So then we get that, uh, then let's divide w by big A, divide both sides by A, right? Divide this by A, divide this by A. And we end up with little w, wage per unit of human capital is equal to this. Now, how do you want to think about this? Okay, this is production. This is kind of a little bit informal, but this is production. This is the rental rate of capital times the amount of capital that the firm is using. Okay, so this is like the cost of the capital. This is like the total production. So it's like total production minus payments to capital. That's what's left over for the wage. That's how, that's an informal way of thinking about it. But anyway, this is the expression for wage per unit of human capital.